Hey. Hey, everyone. How's it going? Yeah. Sounds good at the back there. Good morning, everybody. Did everybody have a good night? No? Everybody's a little hungover, maybe? Well, uh, yeah, I'll take by your silence. You all had a little bit too much to drink, but there's lots of free coffee. So, uh, you know, make sure you get your fill of that. Uh, this morning, we have a great talk by Willie here uh, on exploiting vulnerabilities in H264. First talk of the day, kick us off. So, thank you very much. Awesome, thank you. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm very excited to be here, first time at Recon, so uh, let's go, yeah. We'll be finding and exploiting vulnerabilities in H.264 decoders. This is joint work with Stephen Checkaway of Oberlin College and Hobav Shasham of UT Austin. Bit about myself, I'm Willie Vasquez, I go by WERV, I'm a PhD student at UT Austin. I do research in system security, cryptography, and cyber law and policy. Previously, I was at MIT and BBN, and you can check out my website with more adventures I get into. The roadmap for today's talk is that first, we'll be talking about the decoder attack surface, as well as the complexity of video decoding. And then I'll explain how we're able to tame that complexity with the, our tool called H264Forge, uh, or domain-specific infrastructure to modify encoded videos. And then I'll show you how to use the tool by providing an expanded root cause analysis of an Apple in the wild zero day, CVE 2022-22675. And so the main takeaway I want you to have from this talk is that with H.264Forge, the complexity of working with encoded videos is reduced, unlocking a new attack surface. And something to note is that this work will appear at Usenix Security. Um, the paper is out. You can check it out at that link uh, and get some spoilers. So let's dive right into the video attack surface. So video is everywhere. As you're just scrolling the web, videos will autoplay. As you're messaging your friends, you'll get some, you'll share funny videos with each other. And something to note here is that even video thumbnailing touches the video decoder. So what this pipeline looks like is you'll get an MP4 file, which is a container format that has the encoded uh, video itself inside. And your browser or video player will parse the MP4 uh, uh, metadata and forward along the encoded video to a kernel driver, which will then parse these parameter sets, I'll describe them later, uh, in order to prepare the hardware to take the compressed frames and produce each individual frame that you see. So why do we need this dedicated hardware decoding? It's because decoding is computationally heavy. and uh, we want dedicated hardware to ensure a smooth playback. In fact, in our work, we found over 25 different providers of H.264 decode, uh, decoder intellectual property, or IP, uh, and there's likely even more than, than this amount. And each video decoder has its own kernel driver that controls it. What this kernel driver is doing is it's taking untrusted input from the internet, it's parsing it, and then it's sending it off to the hardware to produce frames. Surely nothing could go wrong. So uh, let me tell you about the Apple Mobile Hardware Video Decoder and what can go wrong. As far as we're aware, uh, Apple the, uh, iPhones have had uh, two different decode IP. First, the Apple D5500 is found in A11 SOCs. It's created by Imagination Technologies. And you'll find other phones that also have this D5500 out there. Uh, later, in the Apple uh, 812, as well as M1 Max, uh, they introduced Apple AVD, which, as far as we're aware, is their own internal IP. And each of these have their own uh, kernel drivers or kernel extensions, KEXT. So surely nothing can go wrong here. No. <laughs> we, uh, we were, in the course of this work, we were able to find three parsing vulnerabilities in the Apple D5500, two of them being zero click. And in fact, as I mentioned earlier, there was this in the wild Apple AVD H264 uh, vulnerability being exploited. And uh, for this talk, we'll be focusing on building, um, building upon the existing root cause analysis in order to get a, uh, I'll show you how to get a heap overflow using this bug. So uh, before we talk about the vulnerability, let me tell you a little bit about the H.264 codec itself. 
H.264, or the Advanced Video Codec, AVC, was uh, standardized in 2003 by two different groups, uh, ITU and MPEG. And so because of this reason, it has two different names, H.264 and AVC. But we're going to be sticking to H.264 for this talk. And the spec itself is over 800 pages describing video decoding. So even though it was uh, originally standardized in 2003, it uh, has been up updated every couple of years. You can see from the screenshot that this is from uh, August of 2021. And what makes H.264 interesting is that it's supported on practically all modern devices. And in fact, it's considered the fallback codec for, for video engineers uh, because they expect almost every device to, to recover it. So the language that H.264 uses to describe videos is what are called syntax elements. And inside of the spec itself, it's shown in this pseudocode-like fashion that describes the direction for uh, decoding, as well as the bitstream representation, or the entropy encoding, for each syntax element. And uh, accompanied, accompanying each syntax element is what are called the semantics. Uh, the semantics describe what each syntax element does, as well as the expected range that it should take on. And we can see in the syntax that these two work hand in hand, uh, depending on if this chroma format IDC is equal to three, it'll uh, parse the bitstream differently. Uh, I also want to note here that for the remainder of this talk, orange boxes, orange dash boxes are syntax elements, blue dotted are semantics, just for your own info. So what we want to do in our work is generate syntactically correct meaning that the bitstream is decoded correctly, but semantically non-compliant videos where our syntax elements are out of bounds. So to show you uh, the, um, why this, uh, what can go wrong with this bitstream representation, um, here we have the opening sequence from last year's recon uh, talks available on, on YouTube. And here's a portion of the uh, uh, bitstream of it. And suppose we take this 72, and we just increment it to 73. And now we get this uh, kind of cascading effect. And let's increment it one more time, 74. And we get this fun rainbow color. Happy Pride. So these, these bitstream representations, um, they can have a, uh, they can lead to security issues. And in fact, other folks have also uh, identified uh, security problems in codecs. In fact, uh, Donenfeld looked at uh, Apple D5500 and has a uh, hack in the box talk as well as uh, a frac article. Uh, Gong looked at the uh, Qualcomm Venus hardware video decoder. Uh, last uh, fall at Hexacon, Terrakonov and Labunets looked at Apple AVD, and Natalie Silvanovich has also looked at Apple AVD and found many bugs. Relevant to us is this in the wild vulnerability that was looked at uh, researchers Binary Boy and Little Lilo, uh, as well as uh, uh, Natalie Silvanovich herself. So let me now explain what this uh, issue was. So this is an in the wild Apple AVD H.264 kernel vulnerability. It was patched in Mac OS 12.3.1 and iOS 15.4.1. And it is a missing bounds check for this CBB count minus one syntax element. And this value is used immediately after as a loop bound to write into an array. It is uh, entropy encoded, and its expected semantics say that it should be within the range of 0 to 31. So in, from this missing balance check, what we want to do is set this syntax element to its maximum possible value and ideally get a crash. The reality is that this, uh, setting this value uh, is a very painful uh, experience. In fact, uh, Natalie Silvanovich herself describes having to forge the file bit by bit, uh, setting up FFmpeg inside of a, a debugger and, and just creating the file this way. And Little, uh, little Lilo and, and Binary Boy also describe their challenges. And the exact issue here 
is the bit level granularity of entropy encoding. So the CBB count minus one value, it's always an odd number of bits. Um, and so you, it's not enough to just pop it in a hex editor and modify things. Furthermore, uh, it depends. There are syntax elements that depend on it. So every time you increment it, you have to update the bit stream in order to modify the uh, dependent values. So doing this by hand at scale is infeasible. And even though it is possible, uh, it is quite challenging. Uh, the lack of tooling is holding back security professionals. So to summarize this part of the decoder attack surface, just three main things uh, you all need to take away is that uh, video decoding, including thumbnailing, is done in kernel drivers and dedicated hardware. The syntax elements have semantics, but those are not always enforced, as we saw in, this, um, uh, in, this, in the wild CVE. And furthermore, modifying the syntax elements is uh, possible, but currently a very challenging process. So let, let me now describe our tool that we created, H264Forge, where now modifying syntax elements is, uh, can be done with, a, with just a few lines of Python. Here's the previous, uh, previously it was a pane, and now setting the out of bounds CBB count minus one is just here. And furthermore, the, uh, the dependent values are also, uh, are also updated. How this works, is that we've created uh, this, this tool and 30,000 lines of Rust that will essentially abstract out the uh, bitstream representation or the entropy decoding and encoding. And what it uh, focuses on is loading up the syntax elements into memory where they can be programmatically modified with Python scripts. Uh, similarly, we can set them to any random value um, in order to generate uh, videos at different kinds of uh, outputs. So uh, we can produce MP4s, encoded bit streams, or any other outputs for different contexts. So this video generation uh, uh, procedure uh, is the same. Uh, here's the same uh, CBP count minus one. We just pass in a JSON configuration for the range of, uh, of each syntax element. And we also get funny looking videos like this sometimes. So with our uh, video generation, we were able to find vulnerabilities in video players, kernel extensions, and hardware. In Firefox, we have this uh, out of bounds read vulnerability. Um, and we also found some issues in, in hardware. And the details of that are, are in our paper. For now, we'll continue to look at the expanded root cause analysis. Uh, we'll continue by looking at this uh, Apple O-Day that was in the wild. Uh, again, why we think this is valuable as a case study is that it's an in the wild Apple kernel day. Uh, that's, that's, that's wild. Uh, furthermore, the, uh, we think it well demonstrates the complexity of the H.264 uh, spec, as well as shows the capability of our tool, H.264Forge. So what Apple AVD does is it creates this uh, user context that maintains the recovered syntax elements in, in memory, along, as, uh, along with other playback information. And CPP by count minus one and its dependent values are stored in, uh, in SPS, which I'll, I'll describe in a bit. And uh, with this out of bounds value, we can get an 832 byte overwrite outside the bounds of the SPS. So the SPS stands for sequence parameter set. It's, this is basically um, uh, the frame size and frame rate of the video. And the user context has an array of 32 SPSs. The picture parameter set, or PPS, is, describes the compression information for uh, compression details for each frame. And we have an array of 256. And these are all both used to, to set up the hardware decoder. So we have this 832 byte overwrite. Uh, we have an SPS uh, that is uh, a little over 2,000 bytes and a PPS that's uh, 600 bytes. So with our overwrite, we can overwrite a neighboring SPS or completely overwrite a PPS. So this that I've, that I've described was already known. Here is um, a screenshot from the root cause analysis where we can see that we can overflow into other members of the decoder struct. Um, 
but even with this knowledge, it was difficult, or, uh, difficult to find a proof of concept media file that crashed the system. Meaning that the condition that allowed this exploit to live out in the wild was probably quite subtle. And here we answer affirmatively that, yes, this is very subtle. There's a lot of dependencies going on. So now I'll be describing an exploitation strategy uh, in order to get us a heap overflow. I want to remind you all that it, as far as we're aware, we don't know how it was exploited in the wild. If anyone here knows, I'm happy to chat. Uh, and uh, so in, in creating our exploit strategy, this analysis was done in iOS 15.4, and we used three main tools, uh, Ghidra for kernel uh, reversing, Corellium for kernel debugging, and H264 to produce our, our proof of concept video. So the key idea here in uh, our exploit strategy is to take advantage of syntax element dependencies to trigger a second larger heap overflow. So first, we have uh, the vulnerability in our SPS, and we'll be able to write over these arrays. We're going to use that in order to overwrite a uh, PPS, uh, specifically this number of reference indices uh, value. This value should only be in the range from 0 to 31, but we'll overwrite it to be out of bounds. This value is used in slice decoding. Uh, a slice is the encoded frame that the hardware works with. Um, and it, uh, in this function, prediction weight table, it's used as a loop bound itself. So we will be overflowing these parameters uh, in order to get a panic. In order to get there, we're going to have to overcome three challenges. First, we'll have to create, construct the bitstream so that it's actually using the values that we are uh, overriding. Second, we'll, um, the, this, this loop I'll show you in a bit. Uh, we need to, get it, uh, need to have it become a larger overflow. And then third, uh, we'll have to figure out how to control where we write. So diving into the first challenge, uh, each SPS and PPS has its own unique ID that acts as an index into the array. So we decode uh, an SPS and PPS with ID 0 so that they're now in, in memory. So that's, that's part one. Then we decode an SPS at index 31 that will then overflow into the, uh, use the overflowing HRDs in order to overwrite a PPS. And we're going for this number of reference indices value. Reminder, this should be within the range of 0 to 31. And in fact, whenever the uh, Apple AVD is decoding this syntax element, it actually does this check. It, it, uh, it saves the value, and then it says if it's greater than 31, it'll print out an error and stop decoding. But because it's already been parsed, uh, and now we're overwriting the value in memory, we have a time of check, time of use issue. So how we actually construct this bitstream, and here I'll be showing uh, Python snippets uh, that are, we use in our tool. Uh, these are just a collection of uh, flags in order to get to the actual uh, CPP count minus one uh, overwrite. Um, and here is where we're actually writing our payload. And uh, uh, some things that I want to point out here is that we are, over, we are overflowing this array in order to overwrite a neighboring struct, meaning that there are some dependencies that we need to be maintained. So like this entropy coding flag, we can just set it to true uh, here in our script. Uh, and this weighted prediction flag, we can just reference an already decoded uh, syntax element uh, when constructing our payload. So all this gets nice and packaged up to the CPP size value minus one, which is inside of uh, the parse HRD or overflow. One thing that I want to point out here is that this number of reference indices that we'll be writing into is a byte value. So the max value that we can set it to is OXFF, 255. Uh, and we'll come back to that in a bit. So now that we've constructed our SPS, we override it, we, we construct, we've modified it in memory, and now we actually want to use it. So decoding each slice, um, 
Here, I'm just going to update the picture to show you that the user context has an array of 600 slices. And uh, uh, this is the number of reference indices. So first, we, we decode a uh, reference picture. And then we decode a, uh, a slice that will actually use our value. And here, the number of reference indices that's used uh, there's this override flag that, it, if it's set, it'll overwrite the value there. Um, but if it's not, then it'll use the default value, the one that we've already overwritten. So we just set that flag to false. We don't want to override our, our value in memory. And whenever encoding the video, we uh, set it to our overwritten value, OXFF. So now that our slice has the uh, out-of-bounds value loaded up in memory, we want to use it as uh, here in this loop bound. So we've set it to 255. And so it's going to loop over in this array, which should only be uh, th uh, 32. Uh, so now we're going to be overwriting into uh, our own slice uh, context. And uh, we can write at most 512 bytes from the start of um, the furthest uh, array object. So here, uh, each slice struct is uh, around 12 kilobytes. So since we can only write 512 bytes, we'll expect it to only write a portion of it. But that's OK. We'll, uh, let's just do it and see what happens. We see that we get a panic. We were expecting the small overwrite, but we end up getting this, this panic. When looking at the disassembly, it turns out that whenever the number uh, reference indices is loaded, it uses this instruction, load RSB. And this signs extends that byte to 32 bits. So now our OXFF becomes OXFFFFF. So now we're, we're, this is looping practically infinitely, and it's uh, going until it runs out of memory. So the question is, can we control this? Can we, get, uh, can we get the kernel to stop early? So looking back at this prediction uh, wait table, now our number of reference indices, we're looping at this uh, 4 billion times. But uh, each time, it's parsing these Luma Chroma weights and offsets. And according to the spec, each one should be in the range of negative 128 to 127, which Apple, the AVD, correctly checks. It'll first write the value into memory, and then, if it, then it'll check if it's out of bounds and exit if so. So that means that all we have to do is write an out of bounds Luma Chroma waiter offset at whatever target we want, and we're good. So now uh, we. Uh, we can write at our uh, at some whatever offset that we want. Um, something that I want to point out here is that memory up to our target is modified. This is because, according to the semantics, when a value is uh, when the flag is not set, it'll write this default value. But it's not issue because we can just enable this flag and write any inbounds value that we want up to uh, our target. How uh, we constructed the video to produce this is that even though the PPS loop bound is OXFFF, uh, we can calculate the exact number of reference indices that we'll need to our target. So here, with some reversing, we, we calculate the number that we need. We set it to the slice. We set some default values. And finally, we uh, write down uh, our target. Uh, we put down the target value that we're writing. So we'll be writing OX4141 there. And we can see here that there's our OX4141. So we did it. We were able to get a, a panic using uh, this, uh, this vulnerability. But wait, there's more. So looking back at this code snippet where uh, our out of bounds value is written, this go to. Uh, it doesn't stop the decoder. In fact, what it does is that it just continues on to the next uh, slice. So we can just do the same trick again. So now we have our first write, and for each subsequent slice, uh, we just do the same thing and uh, write whatever arbitrary value that we want in chunks of UN16. 
And so now as we decode each frame, we're essentially writing our value backwards. If you're interested in seeing what the complete proof of uh, concept looks like, it's in the appendix of our uh, paper. Um, uh, and now here's a, a demo showing how to get the panic on Corellium. So here I've set up an iPhone SE with 15.4. This is a uh, web page that has the uh, attacking context. This is the one that will be overriding into a vulnerable context. And so this, the attacking context is set to autoplay, so it'll automatically load it into memory. And what we first do is uh, play this, uh, the vulnerable context. Also, I need, to, I need to talk with the Corellium folks here. All, none of my videos play, I don't know why. Uh, th this should be a, a, good, a good video, so. Uh, but the, the vulnerable context is played, it, it shows up. And now we overwrite our, we play our attacking video that is overriding the vulnerable context. And once we play the vulnerable one again, we get a crash, a panic. And here we wrote uh, dead beef, got modified a bit, but that address was dereferenced, and our PC is now uh, disjunct. Yeah. So where do we go from here? So. Uh, we've shown you that we can write inside of our user context or also a neighboring user context. Uh, on iOS, uh, the first member is actually a, a packed uh, vtable, uh, so we'd, we'd need a pointer authentication bypass in order to actually uh, escalate from, from here. Um, and in this talk uh, from Hexacon, Terakonov and Labunets suggest smashing other pointers in the neighboring context and uh, winning some race condition uh, when the user context is used. If anyone's familiar with how to do this, I'm happy to chat and, and figure out how to create a proof of concept. So now I've described to you the, uh, the decoder attack surface. that It goes all the way down to the kernel. Uh, I've shown you our tool, H264Forge, and um, I've shown you how to use it uh, to understand this in the wild Apple zero day vulnerability. So with H264Forge, the complexity of working with encoded videos is reduced, unlocking a new attack surface. Um, and again, with this tool, we can create syntactically correct, but semantically non compliant H264 videos. Uh, the code is still being cleaned up. It'll be available at this GitHub link uh, uh, by uh, August, where this work is presented at Usenix Security. Uh, if you want more information, you can check out our paper as well. And I'm happy to take any questions now. <clears throat> if you have questions, uh, raise your hand. Uh, a mic will be brought towards you. So I was wondering, uh, just for the existing like landscape um, of known uh, H.264 codec vulnerabilities, um, uh, how many of those are memory safety um, issues, like kind of at their root? I'm sorry, how many of those are? Uh, how many of those end up being memory safety issues, uh, rather oh. than, say, logic um, issues? We found one uh, denial of service uh, issue. Um, uh, I think most that we found are, uh, are end up being memory safety that are arise from uh, logic related bugs, not not just missing balance checks. Thank you. All right, cool. Well, thanks everyone. I'll be around.